Hi guys, want to say a few words about the Renaissance and the Baroque this week. So we finished going from bottom to top over on the left, wound up on Gothic, and now we're going to come over uh, to the bottom again of the right half of our chart. So if we look at Renaissance, um, of course, you can't have Renaissance without some precursors to the Renaissance. And here's a couple of uh, rather famous paintings, this uh, famous 1434 wedding portrait. Um, and this not quite as famous, but also very well known Madonna and Child. And one of the things I like about this painting, aside from its sort of uh, curiousness, is that it has a sort of a gothic feel. And so we can see, you know, that there isn't some big line from one place to another, but that from over here, we're kind of continuing to flow up uh, into the Renaissance. So we move from the Renaissance or from these precursors to the Renaissance itself. We tend to talk about Italy and the North and, you know, this is this big moment, this big kind of out of this long, you know, thousand year middle ages. This is a reawakening um, kind of toward, you know, sort of just after the Renaissance, the Baroque, the Rococo, we will have the enlightenment, which is really, um, kind of the dawning of the age that we today live in. So this is the beginning of, you know, the, the Middle Ages. Um, religion was very dominant, and certainly in the Renaissance, religion will, will absolutely be very dominant, but it is also a time when we're beginning to be curious again and investigate, and then later in the Enlightenment, um, science will not exactly replace religion. Religion never goes away, but we do begin to look at things from, you know, for better or worse, depending on your perspective, from that kind of perspective. So we move from the early Renaissance to the high Renaissance, which is a very short period of time. It's just 25 years, 1495 to 1520, kind of, you know, ends with the death of Raphael. And so here's Leonardo. This is a painting that I'm sure you've seen. Um, this is the way you actually see it today. There is a lot to say about you know, what it means to, to, to look at a painting that's supposed to be famous in, in this kind of way. Um, uh, so we could discuss kind of what this experience is, but, but let me keep moving because there's a lot to cover in just a couple minutes. And this is really, uh, again, this sensibility that becomes very dominant is this man is the measure of all things kind of sensibility, which we see in uh, Leonardo's Vitruvian Man. Um, Raphael, uh, a really famous piece of his. Textbooks like to use it because they can talk about pyramidal composition and so on. But um, And here's, uh, here's his girlfriend. And it's perhaps an interesting painting in its own right. But what's also kind of interesting is that, you know, years later, uh, Angra paints uh, Raphael painting his girlfriend. And then years later, still... Cindy Sherman does a self-portrait uh, as uh, Fornarina. So if we come over here and look at our timeline, this is kind of our Renaissance timeline in both Italy and the North. People like Raphael, Michelangelo, Leonardo, and then Durer and others in the North. And uh, let me give you an expanded timeline showing, and then let me expand it even a little more. So these three works that I've just shown you, here's the, the Raphael painting from 1518, and then 300 years later, Angra does a portrait of Raphael doing the painting, and then another like 150 years after that, Cindy Sherman um, takes it. So we see the way these, these works seem to ripple across time. Okay, and then of course, this, uh, this Michelangelo guy who obviously uh, you've probably heard quite a bit about, a sculptor, a painter, an architect. He worked, among other things, on St. Peter's. Um, he, worked, he, he painted, among other things, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And he was a sculptor of, of course, among other things, David. Um, so uh, we have... So, so after the Renaissance, we move into mannerism, which is a style that uh, was delightful for many people, but is kind of too much for others. And then we have the North, um, Germany, England. But rather than even go into that, I want to go jump right into the Baroque, again, in our super sort of quick and in, inadequate tour, because I want to talk about Bernini, who 
So we've got Michelangelo here, 1475 to 1564, and then Bernini, 1598 to 1680. And he is so aware of Michelangelo. He too is um, a sculptor, a painter, an architect. And he too sculpts David. Um, and Bernini's very aware of Michelangelo and all the work that he does. And interestingly, um, in, in our class, Art 110, in the past, I've used clickers and uh, put up four David sculptures, these two, the Bernini and the Michelangelo, which are perhaps the best known, and two other rather well-known David sculptures, uh, Donatello and a Verrocchio. And I asked the question, which is the greatest work of art? Just see what students think looking at these four sculptures. And they always pick uh, the Michelangelo. They think it's this beautiful, you know, what art is supposed to be. And I don't know really even what, why I did this, but one day I put up the exact same four sculptures, but I changed the question to who would you rather date? And um, interestingly, although the Michelangelo David uh, dramatically wins the great work of art voting from Art 110 students, the Bernini David um, uh, overwhelmingly takes it when you change the question to who would you rather date? And I was asking students why, and, and one woman in the class said, well, the Michelangelo's, it's beautiful, it's what we think a piece of art should be, but, you know, he seems like, like he's so beautiful, does he really have time for me? And the Bernini David, she felt like this was a guy who really had your back, really would look out for you. <laughs> so, okay. Um, uh, Bernini is also an architect and a theater designer, and this is from the Cornaro Chapel, which is a whole thing he created. And there are other sculptures, and there's, there's really a lot to this chapel. But I'm just going to zoom into this uh, altarpiece, which is um, Bernini's depiction of the late, but not, but only by a handful of years, uh, Saint Teresa, and. What he did, so obviously we don't have electric light at this time, and so what he did is this kind of smart theater designer. These are gold, they're, they're golden color, but they've also got, you know, gold, I think gold leaf applied. And there's a tiny window in the ceiling, which you cannot see, but when you come into this, you know, dark chapel, these golden beams of the background are illuminated by this skylight that's pouring down. And what he's depicting, St. Teresa had visions, and he's depicting one of her visions, which is rather, you know, elaborately detailed in her writing of an angel appearing with a flaming arrow and, you know, piercing her heart, her soul. Um, this is a remarkable piece of sculpture. Uh, technically, if you look at the drapery and what Bernini has managed to um, carve in marble, it's extraordinary. Um, and conceptually, he has really given us something powerful and uh, that perhaps only Bernini might have given us. If we look, so here's a Peter Paul Rubens of St. Teresa. So this is 1615, 1652. Uh, so roughly the same time period. And Rubens has given us, so to speak, uh, you know, what a saint is supposed to look like. And, um, you know, this is, this, is, this is the painting. This is what it's supposed to be. And here Bernini has gone to an, an entirely other place I think this is, if you read the passage, which actually I've got it here, if you click these links, you can see what she's written. But um, if you read the passage, I think this painting, this, this sculpture really captures it, but it's, it's bold of, you know, Bernini to have such a, such an intense vision and to have the, you know, the technical ability to achieve such a work of sculpture. Um, again, in comparison to this sort of more typical, but less engaged image. And when we today look at something like this, you might look at, at her image and her face and sort of see like a sexual ecstasy. I really don't think, however, that was what was what Bernini was depicting or what St. Teresa experienced at the time. It indeed is ecstasy. It is an incredible, you know, I mean, her soul is pierced by an arrow from an angel sent by God. It's an incredible experience. But um, what to our contemporary eyes, you know, might look like, like a sexual or other kind of thing, I think is a divine sort of rapture, um, in fact, for St. Teresa, but a real intensity that Bernini's able to create. Anyway, um, so... Uh, so that so in 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 Italy we have Bernini and certainly others in the Netherlands we have some rather well known folks like uh, Rubens who I just mentioned Rembrandt Vermeer so much to say about them but um, no time in this talk unfortunately to say it and then the Rococo so the Baroque is very dramatic that Bernini is very Bernini that Bernini uh, 
St. Teresa is very Bernini, but it is also very Baroque, very light and shadow, very dramatic. And my sort of cheesy shorthand is to say that the, 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 Baroque, the Baroque is excessive, the Rococo is excessively excessive. So um, uh, this, there's this painter, Fragonard, who um, this is kind of this, this quintessential um, Rococo painting. If you know Dr. Drew from Loveline, he's talked about this painting and believes it's, he thinks that this is a depiction of a birth canal, which is a kind of an interesting take from him. But um, we see uh, this guy has, so this is actually the bishop over here in the shadows. And this guy has convinced the bishop to push the, his girlfriend on the swing so that he can look up her dress. And it's just so much fun and so decadent and excessive and all of that. And then finally, the Rococo, it's like, it's all fun and games and parties up to Marie Antoinette. And then we're just going to chop off her head. And that's kind of the end. And then, you know, from there, uh, we're going to go. So this is, so Marie Antoinette is the late 18th century. And then in the 19th century, as I mentioned, we're going to head into the Enlightenment and a new sensibility. Um, and so, you know, to wrap up all of this uh, excessive, joyous decadence. So here's the Kirsten Dunst version of Marie Antoinette. Um, and here's the Barbie version. And here's the sort of Neo Rococo Johnny Versace version. Um, so that's uh, a quick uh, a whirlwind peek at the Renaissance and the Baroque. Um, feel free to poke through this chart, dive in, or do some, you know, um, Google surfing and, and learn more about some of these artists that I've barely mentioned the names of. Thanks a lot.